Welcome to this quick hit episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Today, I'm joined by Roy Huntington, publisher of American Handgunner and Guns Magazine. Hello, Roy. Hi, Brent. Good to be here, buddy. Well, I got to ask the most important question that's being asked across the country. Are you well stocked with toilet paper? (laughs) <laughs> we went one step. We were well prepared before. Is having a bidet toilet seat considered ah. a, being a prepper? I'm not sure, but <laughs> yes, maybe. Yes, in, a very Yeah, in today's market, prepper. I think so, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what a brilliant idea. And that kind of touches on our, our topic today. You know, right now, almost everybody's stuck at home, self-quarantining, trying to do the right thing to prevent the spread of this virus. And Here at FMG, we've been trying to think of fun stuff that folks can do to ward off that growing case of cabin fever. So we brainstormed quite a list of things for our homebound shooters to do, and we're going to share some of these ideas in the future as this ongoing situation warrants. So with that in mind, let's talk about our first activity, which is dry firing. Now, everybody knows trigger control is considered one of the most critical factors in marksmanship, and it's also one of the most difficult to do well repeatably time after time. That's why dry firing or practicing your trigger pull is such a useful activity. And I got to say, it's one of those things that we all know we should do, but we don't necessarily do it like we should. And now is the perfect time. You know, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of people act like, oh, yeah, I drive fire all the time. It's like, <laughs> I call shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, don't you have one of those really fancy little magic electronic machines? I do. And it is the coolest thing ever. It's called the Mantis X. And we did a review of it recently in Guns Magazine. And Unfortunately, even in the span of a couple thousand words, I couldn't talk about all the features that this thing does. Um, You know, we talk about product a lot. This is like my favorite thing right now. And I'm not just because I'm stuck in the house, but I keep it on a, uh, a Taurus G3 sitting on the shelf empty. And what this thing is, if you haven't seen the review, it's it's a little plastic box that attaches to the rail on the front of your gun. And then it interfaces with your phone or a tablet and it collects and displays all the parameters of your firing cycle. And you can even go further. You can critique your presentation, your recoil management. This thing is just incredible. And it retails for around 200 bucks. So it's, I called it a trainer in a box and it's so far probably the closest thing I've seen, especially at that price point for something that really gives you great data points and feedback on how you're shooting. I keep it, like I said, on this gun on the shelf. And when I've got writer's block, I just pull it down and I, I do my safety checks, make sure everything's still hot, straight and normal. And I, I run 50 or, or so trigger pulls and it really does make a difference. And, and I like to believe that At this point in my life, I'm probably shooting better than I ever have. And I really think that some of that is because of the trigger control feedback I'm getting from the Mantis X. Brent, you know, trigger control is what it's all about. And I tell people that all the time when I teach them here. Uh, well, I've also found having a laser, uh, like a, a Crimson Trace Grip laser, or some kind of a laser, also helps you to sort of watch that trigger control. Because if I'm teaching somebody and I'm telling them, oh, you're, you're really mashing the trigger, and they're saying, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. Well, then I hand them a laser sighted gun, and all you have to do is watch the little red dot jump around the target (laughs) (laughs) and when they go to to pull the trigger it goes woo you know way off the side (laughs) of the target and uh, so i think between these two relatively simple and affordable tools boy someone could really ramp up their trigger control practice you know while they're sitting around at home and even if you don't have any technology whatsoever your gun has sights so just get out or not get out, stay in and practice your dry firing. And of course, if we're going to talk about dry fire, we do have to mention safety because that is really critical in dry firing. I've got a good friend that taught me a little activity that I always say uh, three times, the gun is empty, the gun is empty, the gun is empty. And that 
gets through my thick skull that I have checked three times and made sure the gun is empty. And then, of course, you have to make sure you're, you point it in a safe direction so that if you do have a negligent discharge, hopefully there'll be nothing worse than maybe some drywall damage. Uh, you certainly don't want to point at the common wall going into the nursery or anything like that or aim at the, uh, you know, what is the back of the TV where everybody's sitting on the other side of the wall. So, you know, think about uh, making sure your gun's unloaded and you're pointing in a safe direction. And then the biggest time that I believe uh, people have negligent discharges is at the very end because you get very safe and methodical and you do your dry practice and then you start to load and think, well, I want to do it one more time or, you know, I'm going to put up another different kind of target and just do a couple more. And that's when people unthinkingly put bullets in. So the other part of my little drill is gun is loaded, gun is hot, Gun is loaded, gun is hot, gun is loaded, gun is hot. And again, that seems a little silly, but I repeat it three times to get through my head that I put bullets in this gun and that it's it's ready to do what guns do. Brent, that's really good advice. Uh, what I also advocate is if you're if someone's going to dry fire practice is you unload your gun and you put all of the ammunition in a drawer somewhere and close the drawer. Exactly. And then just as you say, you know, uh, if you've got a revolver, then you empty the cartridges out, you look and count the chamber and you count the number of cartridges in your hand and then put everything away. And then for an auto pistol, drop the magazine, clear the action. I always look in the chamber and then look down in the magazine well, make sure there's nothing there. Put the ammo in a separate drawer. And like you say, okay, now you perform whatever, dry firing, holster work, whatever you're doing. And then once you reload, then play is over. And there's something else you can do, and you can go a couple of different ways, and that's to create a safe backstop. In my case, in your case, Roy, we were issued bulletproof vests, and most agencies, after five years, it has to be retired. So if you've got an old vest or, you know, a police officer who's been on for several years, and he's probably got an old vest panel or two, it never hurts to put that in a frame and put your target over that. So if the, the unthinkable happens and you do crank off a round when you didn't intend to, Hopefully it would be caught by the vest. So that just adds another layer of safety. And something if you don't have access to any of that, a, a nice piece of of steel, you know, maybe a round plate like you'd actually use on the range or just any kind of steel that again, hopefully just in worst case, you've screwed up and you've you've violated all the rules. At least there's one more layer of protection to, to keep rounds from going outside of the area you're you're working in. Uh, and especially true if someone's in a real urban environment, you know. So if you're in an apartment and there are people upstairs from you, then don't load with the muzzle pointing up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, there's an old saying, and it's in and we may have said it before, but the two loudest noise that you'll ever hear if you're a shooter is a click when you expected a bang uh, and a bang when you expected a click. And so yeah. as someone who's been there, I would like to say that that saying is absolutely true. Well, the other old saying that's absolutely true is there's two kind of shooters, those that have had a negligent discharge and those that will. So, oh, And may you always remain <laughs> in neither of those categories. So. Exactly. But but it will happen, kind of like the seasick rule. Yep. So dry fire, it's a great thing, and it's something we all say we do, but we don't do it enough. So this is a great time to practice your dry firing. Let's move on to the other thing. And I came up with this when I was thinking about stuff I've been doing sitting around the house semi board when I'm, I'm not conducting journalism, is I've got an old Winchester Model 94, it's my truck gun and it shoots great. It runs fine, but it's got a, a lot of cheeseburgers and mushrooms down in the action because I've never taken it apart. And I'll be honest with you. I was a certified armor for certain pistols and, you know, I've worked on a lot of guns, but like lever actions in particular, have always daunted me. I was always kind of afraid to get into the guts. Well, you know, the old joke at this point is there's no matter what you're working on, there's four videos on YouTube, how to, how to do it. And that's absolutely true. Now I will caution with YouTube, make sure you don't just watch one, make sure you watch a couple and try to find videos from a reputable source, uh, midway, but try to find videos that demonstrate how to work on your particular gun. In my case, it was a model 94 and actually tackle that task. And First of all, you will do something you've been putting off because you were kind of afraid to do it. Um, and once you do that, you know, it's always a good idea to know how your your weapons work 
and then it'll finally be clean. And a, and a clean gun is a happy gun. <laughs> you know, Brent, uh, we're doing right in the middle of production of our do-it-yourself gunsmithing special edition. And I was writing an article about uh, how to work on a certain gun. And I said, I said, remember the best friend you have right then is your cell phone and that magic camera and video <laughs> in it. Because as you slowly take apart your gun, it's great to go ahead and document it with some pictures and even some short videos. Like this is how that slide lever goes back in, you know, and things like that. But you're right. I'll watch a few YouTube channels and there's always some redneck like me on there <laughs> telling you, you know, well, you hold it like this and turn yeah. it over and except look at the production quality. And, and if they're in a dark closet, you know, with with the mask on, you probably want to click to the next one. I always try to watch it all the way through because I've actually seen a few that you get three or four minutes into it and the guy's, well, hang on, uh, this isn't working quite like I thought. Oh my, well, I, I don't want to go down the same road. <laughs> yeah, I've been there myself. You know? Hey, you know, while, while we're uh, giving some advice out on that, on the FMG YouTube channel, uh, if you click on insider tips uh, on one of the playlists there, we've actually made some videos there. There's a, a how to uh, strip your 1911 and also how to detail strip a Smith & Wesson revolver. Uh, yep. I, I made those a couple of years ago, but uh, I, I think it's the 1911. There's a, a couple of different ways to do that. And then with the Smith & Wesson revolvers, it's they're not really as scary as you think they are, but you do just have to know how to do it. And I think with the slew of people who are buying guns right now, maybe this would be a good time to to encourage them to learn a little bit about it. Like you say, learn to take it apart learn to clean it. And of course, we do have to throw in our usual caveat that we've talked about before. Have real live gunsmith screwdrivers. Don't use the uh, 499 big box store special uh, because you will you will live to regret it because and I've done this and I'm sure you have too, Roy, back in our younger days. OK, I'll use this screwdriver and it doesn't quite fit and it's not really the right type, but I'll be really careful and you're really careful and then suddenly it slips and you've got boogered up screws and it just, you, you, you spend the rest of your time kicking yourself thinking, I just need to get some good screwdrivers. So <laughs> you simply it, have to. it is true. And I don't know why people are afraid to spend the $35 to get one of those little screwdriver tip sets. You know, you can get yep. Brownells had them, Midway has them, stuff like that. But the difference is huge. And suddenly even your grip screws come off easily and, yeah. and you don't have that big scratch down the side plate of your revolver. <laughs> well, okay, I got to throw this to you, Roy. Is there any gun that you're a little trepidatious of taking apart? Oh, the list is endless. But, <laughs> you know, fortunately, we have J.B. Wood who writes for us. And yeah. aside from being the oldest living gun writer, which he readily admits that he is, I think Jay's <laughs> 142 years old, probably. Uh, Jay wrote that series of Gun Digest books on assembly and disassembly of firearms. And yeah. I have his entire set I've collected over the years. And, you know, with rare exceptions, uh, even if I'm not familiar with a gun, you can you can pretty much work your way through them. Uh, I think one of the most important things is just to be quick to admit that you don't know. And yep. so, you know, don't act like because we're men. Right. So we, of course, know everything <laughs> about everything. And I think if, when it, when you take your Glock or your XD or something, and especially a lot of the modern polymer autos, they're all full of little funny springs and little funny sear looking things and bits that go flying off. Uh, you know, just stop and get the book out and watch the YouTube channel. And, you know, one more tip is if you've got an assembly in your hand with lots of springs and pins and things like that, put your hands inside of a gallon Ziploc baggie and disassemble it inside of the baggie. And ah. that, that prevents you from doing the gunsmith's prayer, which is <laughs> on your hands and knees on the floor in the garage while looking for that little pin or spring while your dogs yep. lick your ear. <laughs> well, if you're not familiar that's when you're messing with the gun and all of a sudden a tiny spring goes shooting over your shoulder and you go ah oh, jesus <laughs> so they call those jesus springs it is really true like the, the 1911 uh recoil spring it has a plunger on the end of it yeah. and and every single time i take one apart i do kind of what you do with a loaded gun i always go Recoil spring, recoil spring, recoil <laughs> spring. <laughs> and then even then everyone sort of goes, Frang, and the Frang. dogs, yeah, the dogs stare in the corner somewhere where they hear it hit. And as guys that read Mad Magazine, and as a huge fan of Don Martin, that noise always kind of reminds me of one of his, you know, fweep, 
Wang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there's always a real pregnant pause. And yeah. then that word Jesus comes up again. So <laughs> Exactly. Well, you know, if you're done disassembling your guns and you've you've made an ongoing practice of dry firing, something else we came up with is working with Kydex. Now, a lot of folks do that. I've done it. Roy does it. But if you've not messed around with it and made some holsters and, and knife sheaths and things like that, Kydex is actually very easy to work with. And I just checked as of uh, when we're recording this, two sheets of 0.08 Kydex is about 15 bucks on Amazon. So you don't have to even go out of the house. You order it from Amazon or your preferred online retailer. They deliver it. And then the world is your oyster. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've got, that could be a whole episode is, is my, uh, 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 fight with Kydex because I don't care how meticulous you are. When you first start, you're going to turn out some real abominations. It's just part of the learning curve. But the first time you get it right, it's like, well, that's pretty cool. And I, I want to do that some more. You know, Brent, it's like any skill set. You're going to mess up a few things. I remember the very early days of Kydex. I don't know how long that's been. What, 30 years maybe? Or you know, yeah. at least uh, some of the stuff that the one man shop guys who were really the leading the charge back in those days, some of the stuff they were making was pretty crude. Of yeah. course, it was breaking all the rules and and they were inventing a new industry at the time. Uh, but you can kind of do that even today. Uh, there's there's a, an online store. It's called knifekits.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, just like knife, like you cut with kits.com. But they also do uh, holster making. Uh, with Kydex and stuff like that. And you can buy absolutely everything in the world you need on this website. Uh, you can make knife sheaths and holsters and they, they have a lot of how to, and it's very clear the Kydex range of, of colors and styles and designs is almost limitless. But what I found is that if you get yourself those couple pieces of Kydex, you, you're pretty much already equipped to do what you need to do because you can use uh, a heat gun, for instance, uh, or your, even your oven on a very low setting. And then uh, you can actually use very small nuts and bolts and washers instead of rivets to hold the front and the back together. So I, I agree that you just jump online real quick. You can both buy the product and you can see the uh, YouTube videos of people doing it. And then once you see how easy it is, it's basically you soften the Kydex and then mold it around your gun or knife or favorite pair of pliers or whatever it is. And then once it cools, then you trim it and then uh, you can either um, rivet the front and, to, and the back together, or you can fold things over and, you know, use nuts and bolts. It's very simple, but it's very fun. Our own Jeff Tank Hoover can do it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I think, Brent, you're going to put up links to a couple of articles that we've yes. done, uh, both on making a knife sheath and on making a holster. And I'll tell you what, it came out pretty good. When I was editing the articles, I thought, good Lord, if Tank can do it, then this is something I'm going to have to try. <laughs> and, you know, I haven't done Kydex in probably a year. And, you know, when I was doing a little bit of just quick research so I you know, could talk about this, I've kind of got the fever again. And there's something I want that maybe you could help me with. And have you seen these home built, basically vacuum tables? It's basically a square wood box, probably a foot by a foot or they make them bigger. And the top of it is pegboard. And then you have a uh, frame on the top that holds the Kydex. You heat it, and then you put whatever it is, your, you know, a gun or a knife or whatever on that pegboard. And then you put down the frame with the, the warmed Kydex, and then you hook it to a shop vac. And it works perfectly as good as a commercial, or it look, at least it looks that way, works just like a commercial uh, heat setting vacuum press. You know, they use uh, similar things in, in uh, uh, woodworking shops. You know, I like to ah. build furniture and, and yeah. do things like that. And it's usually used for holding, um, you know, like laminates together yeah. uh, or or that kind of, a you know, thin materials. Yeah, but it, it does. It works really good. You build a box and it's use a good shop vac and you're in business. Perfect. Well, I've tried to do the uh, press with uh, foam and the foam consistency is really critical. And I've tried 15 different types that I've had lying around. And I, that's kind of why I quit working. I, I just never got to where I was really happy with, with my work. But now I'm kind of excited. And we've all got a little more time around the house. So maybe I'm going to have to order me some more Kydex. 
You know, and keep thinking outside of the box too. A, a minute ago, I said, or, or your favorite pair of pliers. Uh, I do a lot of work around my property here, drive the tractor, have, we have mowers and things like that. And I've used Kydex to make some uh, sheaths for little machetes that I've zip tied to the roll bars. And yep. I've got a little tool pack that I made with a few basic slots. Certainly, this is really crude stuff, basically. and yeah. uh, But rough molded with a heat gun. And But gosh, they're so handy. And like you say, it just costs a couple of dollars for uh, the Kydex that, that you're going to use. And then you can you can bask in the I made it myself uh, <laughs> things when people say, where'd you buy that? And you can make one for them at a very reasonable cost. <laughs> yeah, which means you'll only lose your shirt depending on how many that you make. Yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully we've given folks a couple of good ideas, stuff to be doing around the house, and we're working on a few more of these. So hopefully we won't run out of any ideas until this thing stops and we can all get out and frolic in the sunshine. So if the listeners have any great ideas, contact me at editor at gunsmagazine.com. And we would certainly love to hear what other folks are doing when they're sitting around the house. Thanks for listening to this quick hit episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. If you have comments or questions, please send me an email. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Remember, you can listen to us at gunsmagazine.com, the podcast tab, or subscribe to us at your favorite podcast directory. While you're at it, don't forget to also check out American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com. Whatever you do, please tell all your friends, even the liberals. On behalf of Roy Huntington, I'm Guns Editor Brent Wheat. Now, I always say get out there and get shooting, but I'll say get out there and get shooting when you're allowed to. Stay safe. Stay safe.